we have chapters all around the world. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the IGDA mission from the top level organization standpoint. So we basically exist to advance the careers and enhance the lives of game developers. And that, does, that means whether or not you develop games as an indie, whether you develop games for a large studio, it doesn't matter. If you develop games, um, you're welcome the IGDA. Um, because w game design is game design. We even welcome some board game designers who are, are not doing any kind of video game related stuff. Because the fundamentals of game design are the same no matter what the platform you choose to use it on. Um, some of the top priorities of the IGDA, we really have four top priorities. Um, one is advocating on key issues. And what I mean by that is essentially being a voice for game developers when there's issues in different countries, such as, as I will touch upon in a moment, issues in the United States about the connection between gun violence and video games, which is a very, very serious issue. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of discussion about it. Um, obviously, networking and community is a very big part of our mission. Um, this is part of the networking that we're, that we're in right now. Um, but also, the existence of the IGD chapters, those exist for this purpose, that developers have a place to go and to share and to talk with one another and discuss their craft. Um, also, encouraging professional development. We're, I don't think any of us, who in this room knows everything you need to know about game development? <laughs> Not you. Um, <laughs> See, we all need to learn, excuse me, um, we are all in a process of learning and, and developing our careers and to uh, gain a better understanding of our profession, especially in a profession that is continuously evolving. I don't think any of us can guess exactly where the game industry is going to be 10 years from now. And if you can, then I don't know why you're in this room because you should be probably rich on your own island somewhere. Um, so we, we want to foster professional development. And of course, we're expanding our international reach as well. Part of the, part of the reason the IGD exists is for this very purpose to connect us across the globe. It's not just about the camaraderie and the community in a, in a specific city or in a specific country, but connecting each other with around the globe. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a few issues related to advocacy and um, we'll just go through this. And um, now this picture, um, if you don't know what this is, this is Hampton Court Palace in, in the UK. And um, it's a great walled garden. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard the phrase walled garden used in relationship to a lot of IT companies like Yahoo and Microsoft. And we use it in the game industry as well. And I think from my perception, oftentimes the game industry itself acts like a walled garden. And what I mean by that is that it tends to focus only on itself and its own issues and kind of ignores some of the things going on around it, like some of the opinions of the public and some of the actions by governments, um, I don't, which I don't think is the case here in Colombia. I'm really excited to see the collaboration between the industry here and the government, but that's not always the case in a lot of other countries. Um, and so that causes problems when game developers focus inwardly too much, you kind of lose touch with what's happening around you and about what's being said about your profession and about your industry. And so we have to be conscious of that. So for example, um, the issue of gun violence and the, and the connection that people want to make between violence and video games. Um, this connection is, is one of the probably one, the number one thing that a lot of uh, legislators want to do is to make that connection because then it means that they can regulate video games and tax them or do something that's going to restrict their uh, their distribution and creation. Um, you know, if there really was a connection between gun-related violence and and video game consumption, this is the kind of chart that we should be seeing. And I'm, a, I'm I apologize for the resolution, but these are different countries. Um, this is the Netherlands up here, United States up there. Um, Australia, Germany, Canada, um, South Korea. And so this is the way the chart should look if there is a true correlation between violence and video games. But the data shows us that this is the way the chart really goes, is that with greater consumption of video games, we are actually seeing a decrease in violence. And if you look at it on the, on the level of just the United States, you can see here the gray bars represent the, the uh, computer and video game sales from, what is that, from 1998 all the way to 2011. And you can see, and the green line is the occurrence of violence and uh, gun-related murders. And so there is actually a decrease in association with the consumption of video games. And so this is the kind of thing that a lot of politicians, at least in the United States, they completely ignore the data. 
and instead they think the chart goes exactly the reverse. Um, and so that's part of what we're trying to do as an organization is trying to advocate and make sure people are aware of the reality of this kind of situation. Um, as you know, in the United States, we have the ESRB, the Entertainment Software Ratings Board, that, that acts as a self-policing mechanism within the industry to look for issues like violence and profanity and, and sex and all these other things. Um, and a lot of other countries, of course, have their own rating system. There's Ciro in Japan, the PEGI system in Europe, the GRB in Korea, and so on and so forth. And this, is a, this has been basically a method that is um, both appreciated by game developers and hated by game developers because it, whether, whether or not it's by the government or by some self-policing mechanism, they still don't like being told what to do, which is completely understandable. We are working in a very creative medium, and so that's understandable. But think about the alternative. If we don't police ourselves with our own kind of ratings, this is what you get instead. You get government bureaucracy, which is basically developing an entire system um, to develop controls on the content because they want to make sure they protect the people. Um, they want to put labels on video games to make sure that people understand that there is a risk. Um, this is a proposed label. This is not a real label, thank goodness. Um, but in the United States, as of last year, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that video games are protected free speech. So under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, the video games have the same rights as artwork and movies and books and all these other forms of creative media. Um, and so this is both good and bad from my perspective. It's great because we do have that protection. Um, that's a very important milestone, at least in the United States. Um, it's bad because a lot of game developers assume that this means that they're okay now and nothing's going to happen. But the truth is that the legal system in the United States is such that it's easy to get around even a Supreme Court decision. And so there's all kinds of states at the different state levels working on different kind of laws that would still regulate video games for different reasons. Um, so this is not an instant protection. But there's another issue as well. Um, well, plus the fact that it is a, uh, it, this only affects the United States. This does not affect, you know, pretty much, well, it doesn't affect anywhere outside the United States. But there's a lot of countries that are still extremely strict and there, there's all kinds of issues going on. Um, and I realize too that the term Americans means all of us, not just, not just the United States. So um, anyway, but there's still a bigger issue is public perception. You can address this on the legal level with Supreme Court rulings and things like that nature, but you still have a huge issue with the public perception of what game creators are, what we do, what we add to the community, what we add to society with our creative force. And so this is a much bigger issue that we have to deal with. And so part of the reason, I believe, why this perpetuates, even though we have legal protections or not, is um, part of the reason is because we, as game developers, are not vocal. We don't interact a lot with the community. We don't interact a lot with the gamers. Now, we are gamers ourselves. So we, I think sometimes we lose the fact that because all of us are gamers, we interact with ourselves in the industry and we think that we're interacting with gamers, but we're not necessarily interacting with true consumers who don't make games at all. They're the ones who flame us for bad decisions in games or they really appreciate different things that we've done. Um, so that's a whole different issue. So I'm going to ask these questions. I'm not expecting an answer, but it's something to think about as, I, as we go along. So as you, as an individual game developer, when's the last time you ever talked to your lawmakers about to voice your opinion about whether it's good or bad, whether the lawmakers are actually doing something or not, when's the last time you actually spoke up and say, hey, I'm a game developer, this is my livelihood, I'm proud of it, um, I want you to understand what I do for a living so that you can make decisions that are going to reflect you know, the, what I'm doing. No, 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 you're fine. Um, so let's go on to another issue. Um, how about pr the portrayal of women in video games? Um, this has been a controversial issue as well. And again, it's controversial in different countries. It's not universal because culture is not universal. So we've had some portrayals of women in games that are not exactly flattering. Um, we've had ones that are actually stronger characters that ha take on more of a lead role um, within the game, and it's really cool. Um, We've had characters evolve, going from something that was more of a sex symbol to actually a character that in, in the latest iteration has actually been a stronger female lead, um, which is very encouraging to see. Um, 
So, but during the course of the, the game creation, when's the last time you actually raised a concern to people on your team about a stereotype being used, whether it's sexism, whether it's, uh, whether it's you know, the portrayal of women, whether it's the portrayal of uh, LGBT people, the portrayal of minority people, portrayal of other cultures or other nationalities. Um, these are things we have to be conscious of because every time we employ a stereotype, um, if you want my honest opinion, st using stereotypes in game creation is complete lazy creativity. It's basically not taking the time to really think through your decisions and, and develop something unique and interesting that fits your game. Other, other in, so instead, you're just taking a stereotype off the shelf and plugging it into your game and moving on with what you need to do. And so I encourage you not to use stereotypes. I encourage you to really think about the characters that you're using in the game. Um, and also speak up. When you see like a fellow designer creating something, don't be afraid to ask them, so why are you doing it this way? Just ask them the question, kind of help them think through the decisions that they're making. Um, on another issue we deal with all the time, I don't know if you've played this game, um, Game Dev Story, that was on iOS, I think it was on other platforms too, but you can see that these, these poor little uh, game developers are in flames because they're in crunch mode. And so it's interesting that in this game about game development, crunch mode is actually part of the gameplay. But you know the reality though is that crunch mode in other industries, most other industries outside of games, they call it poor project management. That's what crunch mode really is. Um, now we understand that there's always going to be a certain intensity when you finish a project. That's a given, because especially with creative projects. I don't know a single creative project that has not had some level of intensity at the end, like a movie. Think of about, you know, I know people who work on movies and the, the last few weeks are just crazy as they're trying to get it done. Um, games are like that too, but when it becomes expected, when like your employer says, no, we expect you to do crunch time on a weekly basis, then you're, then you're looking at a different problem. When, when having to work those kind of hours become an expectation, then that's, that again, like I said, that's poor project management. That's not planning out the game well. And um, that again is something that we need to address. So, you know, think about the last time you experienced crunch mode, if you have, if you have, has anyone not experienced crunch mode making a game? There's one. Good for you. Yay, victory. Um, so hopefully someday there will only be like one person who does not raise their hand. So, um, and I understand this is a very sensitive issue because if, you're, if your employer expects you to do crunch mode, you're, you don't want to lose your job, right? So you don't want to speak up. And so you have to find ways to discuss with them. Um, and it's actually something the IGDA is doing is just helping management understand better practices for project management just so they understand the kind of pressure that they put on game developers, which can be pretty extreme. And at the end of the day, are you really getting the best work out of your developers when they're completely exhausted and tired? Um, another issue is about community. You know, I think scenes like this are very familiar. We've all seen this kind of stuff um, at different gatherings around the world. We all get together, we share, we show each other's projects to one another. We also seek out mentors and mentor-mentee relationships um, because it's really important. Um, that's, yeah, that's a different kind of mentor relationship. Um, so when's the last time you in your community um, mentored someone, someone who was needed some help? and um, you, they just were seeking some kind of advice on, and it doesn't matter what it was, they may have had one question, they may have had, needed a lot more advice, like how to get a game company started, um, uh, or sought out a mentor if you're starting in the industry and you want to get some help from someone, and obviously I'm encouraging mentorship. I think it's a really, really strong part of our industry because we sort of have a, uh, a mentor apprentice model in this industry to some degree. It's not formal, but you know we all learn from game developers. Um, that's why we have events like GDC and other events around the world, big game conferences, because we all, we're all going to learn and to get some advice. Um, have you attended an IGDA chapter meeting or any other kind of game development meeting to talk to game developers and just kind of see what they're doing and see what's going on in their community? Um, you know, because I know that there's a tendency with a lot of creative types, including game developers, to basically go in their room and close the door and just work 
all they want to do is work and then someday in a few months the lights will you know the the window will open and the sun will shine and their game will be released um, so but there's a lot of value in talking with other game developers even while you're you know working hard on your game just to kind of get a sense of what's going on and staying in touch um, and also helping students or a colleague with a development issue um, that's really important too just be a source of advice I mean there's a lot of value in helping each other this is one of the things I have been so encouraged by in the indie community that I've seen in different cities I know in my in where I'm based in Seattle but in other cities around the world is the indie community at least from what I've mostly seen they're very cooperative with each other it's like yes they are competitors but at the same time they're all kind of learning at this uh, learning together and um, I've seen a lot of cooperation and collaboration like we had at one of the uh, indie meetups in Seattle um, some we you know they show their games like the latest version of their game and the, it will, they'll show it and then we'll talk about it and you know there'll be people saying oh I noticed you have a problem and I've got a piece of code that I think will solve that for you you know and it's that kind of thing which I think is great because we're all trying to help each other um, the other thing I was going to talk about and go into a little bit more detail is um, relates to my background um, I, I'm actually a geographer um, who's worked in the game industry for 20 years and my job in the industry has been um, to do what I call culturalization so I, I help game companies with political and cultural issues in their game content and so that's what I do still on the side when I'm not doing my day job um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about this as well because this also impacts us as game developers because we do live in a global world we are not isolated we're not just selling games to fellow Colombians we're not just selling them to fellow you know US citizens um, we're selling to the world anything you release online is instantly worldwide whether you want it to be or not so you have to be very cognizant of the fact that your content is going to be out there um, so right now localization localized versions of video games make up about 50 percent of the global industry's revenue that's a lot of money that's a lot of money coming from just localization. Um, PricewaterhouseCoopers, they do an annual survey or projection. This one is a little bit outdated, but they're showing that the game industry growth is going to still continue around 10% a year on a global scale. Um, and through 2015, they're saying that the global, the total worth is going to be $82 billion. And that's almost double what it was in 2007. So it's even despite the global uh, economic slowdown, it, the game industry is still growing very quickly. Um, at different companies, some companies, their revenue from, local, from localizing their version is as much as 70% of the company's revenue comes from localized versions of their games. Um, so that's one of the reasons why when I'm talking with like indie developers, I often encourage them, um, like in the United States, I say take one, at least localize into one language, which I usually suggest Spanish, because they localize into Spanish, even though I realize there's a lot of you know, vocabulary differences and grammatical differences throughout Latin America, but still, you at least open up your game to the entire Western Hemisphere, minus Brazil, but, uh, you, know, you, but you open up a huge uh, amount of uh, potential customers and potential game players to your game by doing just one language. Um, so the base, the bottom, the, the point here that I'm trying to make is that you really want to design for a global audience. Um, it's really critical for the long-term growth of the industry because the growth is really not, the growth is occurring in Latin America. It's occurring in Asia. Well, I should say South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, Middle East is a very quickly growing region for game development and for game consumption. Um, Africa, as was mentioned earlier today, Africa is slowly starting to pick up as a game development. Um, uh, place for game development. So the, the, the basic idea is that yes, the US and Europe are always going to be important markets, but that's not where the major growth is happening. Um, so there is a shifting emphasis going from what we could call localization, which is usually just the language translation, you know, which is like I was mentioning. It's just basically taking the text and translating it into another language and doing what I call culturalization, which is actually taking it a step further and designing your game for a more global audience. Um, and so this is becoming more and more critical, not only to reach other, tar reach other target gamers, but also to differentiate your game from just another game that's been localized. So let me give you a, an example of a difference between localization and culturalization. So these are uh, strawberry Kit Kat bars. And the top one is Canadian. You can see it's in uh, English and French. 
and the bottom one is in Japanese. And these are essentially the exact same product. The only difference has been the package is, is this uh, language up here and a different language down here. That's basically localization. Culturalization, on the other hand, is where you take that idea, so like the Kit Kat bar, and in Japan, they have tons of different flavors of, of Kit Kat bars. Um, and they've, they've actually regionalized the flavors so that they have different flavors in different areas of Japan. Like you can see this map shows you where the different flavors can be found. And um, so this is taking a simple candy bar and making it something completely wholly unique to Japan. You will not find this in any other country. This is the Kit Kat bar has been taken to a completely different level of relevance to in, in Japan. So in the United States, we still have, I think, just two kinds of Kit Kat bars. So, um, yes it is, wasabi Kit Kat. So, um, so culturalization is really taking the idea and making it more relevant to that particular uh, country. So we're talking also about culture. Now I don't want to go in, I could speak for days on what culture really is, but I'm not going to do that. So what, what I, the way that I see culture is basically it's the accumulation of content from a specific context. Um, and what I mean by that is, is you can look at culture as basically a set of content assets. So when we create video games, what do we do to create up the world? We have a set of content assets, the sound, the, the look and feel, um, the, the, you know, and everything else that we do to create that world. Um, and so any given culture on earth can be also be defined by certain content assets. So there are certain things that make up cultures, the, the, si the sound, the taste, the look of it. Um, so there's sort of a compatibility between the game world you're creating and the content assets you're using to create that game and the cultures that you're interacting with as you're sending your game to different countries. So you can look at it this way. So you're creating your game worlds um, and there's also the local worldviews, the different cultural perspectives that you will be sending your game to. And so the goal is to basically splice those together as best as you can and anticipate how those work together. Um, because when in that process of combining those two things, there's, there's a potential for incompatibility. So you're either going to put things in your game that people don't care about, and it's fine, or you'll put things in your game that will be very sensitive to that specific culture, and that will get you in big, big trouble. And I'm going to go through some examples in a minute. And so the, the goal, though, of course, is culturalized content. So you get some kind of compatibility there um, with what you're creating. Now, the other thing I want to point out here is that there's, I generally identify two, two audiences for game content. One is the intended audience. So these are the game players. We, those are the people we know. Those are the people we know what kind of stuff they like, or we hope we know. And um, so we want them you know, to play our games and be happy. Those people, all they care about is, is if the game is good or not. That's all they really care about. The unintended audience are the people who don't play video games. These are the people who, um, like, uh, they tend to run churches, and they tend to run government, and they tend to be parents. Um, and uh, these are the people who misunderstand the context of content within a game. So they'll look at one little piece of, of, of pr they'll see one little thing in a game and they won't understand why it's in the game because they don't play games. And so that, that is a problem. And so we have to be thinking about when, with culturalization, it's often focused on removing problems that can come from this group because this is the group that's going to react in a, in a negative way and not understand what we do as, as creative game developers. So I'll give you a couple examples here. So reactive culturalization. So with reactive culturalization, what I mean is that you're trying to remove things that will be a problem. And so in this, this is, does everyone know what this is? This is Fallout 3. And so in this game in Fallout 3, you can see here a two-headed animal. It's a two-headed Brahmin bull. And it was mutated and radioactive and it would wander around and you could kill it and eat it, although it's bad to eat. Um, the problem, though, is that this, because it's a Brahmin bull, a Brahmin bull is sacred to the Hindu religion. Therefore, this game could not be sold in India. And so we went back to the, the, the developer and said, can you make this something else? You can see my really poor Photoshop job here. I made a two-headed horse instead. So, but my point is that any other animal would have worked. A two-headed horse, a dog, a giraffe, whatever. 
Uh, but the fact that it was a two-headed Brahmin bull directly affected you know, that particular locale for India, and they wanted to import the game, but they could not, and the developer could not change the animal because it was too late. And so this game never got sold in India. So the, so the developer just lost out on a large potential market, um, of a growing market. Proactive culturalization, here's one where Marvel Comics decided to make a version of Spider-Man for India. And um, now this version actually was not hugely successful. It did okay. But the point is that what Marvel was trying to do was really do something that felt local. They actually partnered with a local comic book studio to make this comic. And you can see how they culturalized Spider-Man to give him a more Indian appearance. And um, yeah, there was, there's mixed reviews because the, the reality though is this touches upon another subject is where a lot of people around the world, they want the original. They want the original Spider-Man. They don't want this Indian version of Spider-Man. They don't want a local version of a superhero that they really love. And so that's something to think about too. But it was an interesting experiment and they were trying hard to do a very proactive culturalization. So I'm gonna talk very quickly through um, what I call the five major cultural issues in games. So these are five things you need to think about when you're making your game, especially if you're planning to send these games overseas and get people in other countries to, to like your game. Um, so there's history, using historical themes in a game. There's sacred and secular, so using religion in a game. Um, inclusion versus exclusion, what I mean by this is like excluding a person of a certain ethnicity or a certain nationality or gender or, or something else. Um, there's also cross-cultural fi friction, which I'll ex I've got examples for all these. Um, but the, what, I'm, what I mean here with the friction is like when one, there's one market that does not like the other one or there's like long-term cultural friction between them. So you have to be very careful about what you do, what you release in one country and how another country might react. And then finally, geopolitical imaginations. So this is where governments try and reinforce their viewpoint of what their territory is, th usually through maps. And I'll show you an example. So the first one is history. So historical memory is very persistent. People do not forget their history. Um, it's easy for us in the United States to say that because we really don't have much history. We're only a couple hundred years old. Most countries like yours are, I mean, you know, you've got a history extending back thousands of years um, that still is perpetuating, whereas, whereas and, it, and it depends. Most, most cultures around the world have a very long and rich history. Um, so people, if you use history in a game and you use it incorrectly, people are not gonna be happy about it. So here was an example from Age of Empires where you can see in the top map, this is the way the scenario was or originally created. So I'll explain very quickly. The red, um, the red Army is the Koreans. It's what's called the Chozon Empire back in the Middle Ages. The Blue Army is the Yamatos, which are coming in from Japan. So this is what history says really happened. The Yamatos invaded the Korean Peninsula and they took over. So the Korean government said, no, this never happened. And we're not releasing this game because this is factually incorrect. And so what we had to do was actually create a patch for the game in Korea to change history for the sake of the Korean government. Otherwise, this game could not be released. And we did this, this you, as you can imagine, this, this brought up a lot of business decisions and a lot of talks about ethics. Is it ethical to change history in order to sell a game? And um, we decided to do it because it's another form of localization. Even though it's, it definitely flies in the face of history, but you can see what really happened in the fix. So this is the way the game showed up in Korea as you can see, they changed the scenario so that the, the Koreans are actually invading Japan. So they completely reversed the situation um, to make the Korean government happy. Um, and so this is debatable if this was the right thing to do or not. At the time, they felt it was the right thing to do because RTS-type games like this, as we know now, are extremely popular in Korea. It's, it's a very popular uh, mode of gaming. So. Um, but this is just one example of where history can be a potential issue. Um, so talking about the sacred versus secular issue, so when you're dealing with cultures that maintain um, expectations that are based on religious beliefs more than a secular belief, you have to be conscious of what those issues might be. Um, 
so these two games both had issues because they both included an audio track that contained chanting from the Quran, from the Islamic Quran. And that's a problem um, because that's sacred. And so the one on the left is one that I actually worked on. And they actually found the issue literally days before the game was releasing. And so the there was a decision, should we release the game um, and just see what happens, which I was like, no, 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 no. You don't want to do that. Um, or, they, or we said we could fix it and then release the game, which we were like, yeah, that's the right thing to do. Now, Microsoft at the time, you know, what they were saying is, so they agreed, we'll fix the issue, but they already had 70,000 units already created and already moving to the stores. So what do you do with those units? And so they decided to release it only in the U.S. because they said, well, the U.S. is, you know, we won't have a problem in the U.S. So, and of course, I tried as a geographer, I'm trying to explain to them that the U.S. has a very large Muslim population, um, as, as well as many other kinds of populations. And th but they just said, no, it's okay. Well, three months later, the M Microsoft gets a letter um, from the government of Saudi Arabia asking for this game to be taken off the shelves. And the, the thing is, the game was never even intended to be sold in Saudi Arabia, but it still got there. Um, so it was a huge issue. The game eventually got globally recalled, taken off all the shelves worldwide. So can you imagine working on a game for three years and having one audio file sabotage all of your effort because the game was taken off the shelves and completely discontinued forever? Um, this game, Sony, a few years later, they had an audio file as well, but they fixed it before release, but they delayed the, re they delayed the release of the game by three weeks in order to fix it which is great, I really applaud them for that. But what they also did is they had a press release and told everyone why they were fixing the game. And they told them that there's an audio file with chanting from the Quran in it. And so people still got very upset because then they were telling Sony, how could you be so stupid not to know what the audio was in the first place? So you can't win. So basically, there's a, there's a basic rule here. If you're using an audio file with lyrics, make sure you know what those lyrics are from. Don't just use them in your game. Um, so this was a huge problem. Um, so yeah. So inclusion versus exclusion. So when, when you have a scenario in a game that has perceived inequitable treatment between two cultures or ethnicities or gender or nationality or whatever it might be, this is always a potential sensitive issue as well. So I'm sure a lot of us saw these images before Resident Evil 5 released. And in the United States, this was a huge uproar because what you're seeing is uh, this nice, clean, white guy shooting you know, sub-Saharan African villagers. And that imagery is very strong. It's a very racist imagery in the United States and in other parts of the world. Um, and so, of course, the response from the company was like, well, but they're zombies, so it's okay. But what they don't understand is the historical nature of the imagery that's been in media for years that portrays African people or African Americans in a certain way. And that's still a very pervasive and very strong message. And so the notion of the dark continent or the great white hunter um, from 100 years ago, those, those feelings still are very much alive. So you have to be very careful. Um, Cross-cultural friction. So this can be for all kinds of reasons. It could be historical, it can be political, um, but two, two or more countries may not like each other. So, um, so here's Age of Empires 2, and I hate picking on Age of Empires and Korea, but they're great examples. So, and I worked on them both, so I feel okay using them. Um, so in Age of Empires 2, can anyone tell me why this box art would have been a problem in Korea? Any idea? Yes, it's because of the Japanese samurai. So the reason why, why was the Japanese samurai sensitive at this time in 1999? The reason is because at the time, and, they, and still today, the two countries are disputed. They dispute a little rock in the middle of the Sea of Japan called Dokdo in Korean or Takashima in Japanese. And so in 1999, they were at one of their peaks of, of anger towards each other. And so the Korean retailer said, we do not want to put a box with a, with a Japanese face on our shelves. And so they basically had to change the artwork, and then the box was OK. Um, and so when they had in the expansion pack for the Age of Conquerors, this is what most of the world saw.
But then in Korea, they actually did this version that shows a Korean general front and center, which sort of makes up for the problem with the original release. And so, um, and if you think this isn't a problem, right now, I'm sure you've heard about Japan, Taiwan, and China are disputing the Senkaku Islands, or also called the Dayu Islands, uh, in the uh, East China Sea. Well, in December of last year, the um, sales of Japanese goods in China dropped like over 50% because of this. Toyota lost 50% of their revenue because Chinese people were not buying Japanese products because of the dispute going on in, in, out in the middle of the sea. So this kind of stuff matters. You kind of have to think about what's going on in these local markets and if your content might have anything related to those markets. So it's something you have to be thinking about. And then finally, the geopolitical imaginations part is where governments like to reinforce their, their sovereignty, their control, uh, and their territory through maps. Um, and I apologize, I, have o I only put one example for the sake of time, but I've got like a billion examples of all of this stuff. But um, here's one, there was a game called Hearts of Iron. There, was a, there were two versions of the game. And you can see, if, any, has, if anyone's played the board game Risk, this is very much like Risk. So the world is divided up into these arbitrary sections. And you can see here that China is divided up into many different sections. But uh, Tibet and Taiwan are not shown as being part of Chinese territory. Of course, a lot of other parts aren't either. But the government focused on Tibet and Taiwan because those are the more politically sensitive. And so they, China banned this game because those are not shown as part of China. Now here's the funny part, is that this game takes place in World War II. In World War II, the People's Republic of China did not exist. So, so, that, so the government of China is basically reinforcing who they think they are, even into the past, beyond their own existence. So this is, it's, but it's one of those things that some governments do, and you just have to understand the kind of issues that you might be dealing with. So all of that was a big, uh, big uh, introduction to lead to this question. When is the last time you thought about how your content will be perceived internationally? And it's something to think about, it's, it's especially today, because you can really make a huge success. I've seen some indie games, they're not very popular like in their local country, but they release it somewhere else, and for whatever reason, that, that there's some country across the globe that totally loves it. Like, I forget the name of the game, there's a game that was made in Korea that is just hugely popular in Turkey. And they have, it's like a medieval fighting game with knights. And they have no idea why it's popular in Turkey. It just kind of caught on, and now it's just like the most popular game in, the, in Turkey. So you never know who's going to like your, your game. So finally, I just want to close by talking about community, because that's really what we all are here. We are a community, not just locally, but again, globally, is that we have a passion for games. That's, all, that's why we're all in this room right now. Um, we also have a passion for game development, which is also why we're in this room. Um, and so we share that, and because we share that, we are an instant community. We all desire to learn and improve um, our craft. We all desire to share and teach, or we should desire to share and teach what we're doing and to help others um, improve their craft as well. And we want to focus both locally and globally. We want to be very well connected to the people around us, you know, in the same room, but also across the world. Um, because we're all doing the same thing. We all love it. We all love game development. And so I just wanted to, uh, to reiterate that, um, you know, we, to stand up and speak out, not only on advocacy issues, but on stuff around game design and choices being made in game design. Make sure you stay connected with your peers. Don't become one of those developers that goes off in a little hole and never appears again. Um, and share your wisdom. Be willing to share, because that's, that's really how all of us get better at what we're doing. And also just make sure you design for the world, because, um, whether you like it or not, the world is watching what you're doing. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate, for your, for your talk. Uh, while we start preparing for the next talk, maybe we have uh, time for one question. Mientras comenzamos a preparar alguna pregunta, está ahí atrás.
Okay. So in, in Latin America, in general, it's difficult to, to start your, your own startup while you have to eat and you have to pay your expenses. So what is, what is your best advice that you can give to people that are trying to start and at the same time they are trying to live and have their jobs, but at the same time they want to do games? Um, that's a great question. So my advice is basically you, you know what your limits are in terms of what you can and can't do, and you know your time, how much time you have to devote to the game development versus to things you must do. Um, and so you, you, I would just say you got to be persistent because most things that we achieve are it's going to be through very, you know, a great deal of persistence to make it happen. Um, so even if you can do a little bit every day, so if you set aside time every day, even put it on your calendar, like every day for like one hour or how much time you have available, focus on doing the game development. Focus on doing something related to what you want to do, and over time it will build itself up. Um, I think also if you can connect with other people, because a lot of us are in the same position, we're all busy with many different things. So if you find a small group of people who are in your same position, maybe you can kind of share the task and together you can kind of make up enough time to create something. Um, but, I, but just be persistent. I know it can be discouraging at times, but you just have to keep trying. Thank you, Kate. We, we are out of time. But uh, let's, let's thank again to Kate. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sonia Angelesva. Uh, Angesleva, sorry. Uh, she is the president of IGDA Finland and an active member of the Finnish game developers community. Um, IGDA Finland is the first formalized IGDA chapter outside North America and has grown to become one of the most active IGDA chapters in the world. Without further introduction, I'll, I'll leave uh, uh, Sonia to, to start. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, I'll start with um, one of my favorite quotes which goes, give me a place to stand and I will move the world. It's said by Archimedes, and Archimedes actually was talking and working on, on levers, but I'm using the quote uh, when talking about building a game community. So my talk is, is about um, how Finnish game development community and give game uh, development as an industry has grown and improved during the last 20 years. Um, the problem with, um, when talking about games and game development is that people tend to look at the, the most recent things, most recent games or most recent successes. But uh, the reality is that we, like in Finland, have been growing and improving the industry for quite some time. And that's why I wanted to uh, share four stories with you to give an idea how we uh, built the industry and hopefully how you can do that too. Um, so four stories. The first uh, story is about passion. And I have, okay, now the guys are not <laughs> fully showing on the screen, but I have two main characters in this story. This one guy who is a bit outside the uh, image is Jani. He um, was working in one of the first Finnish game studios that were started in the early 1990s. The company was called Blood, Blood House. And many of the guys worked in the early times of game industry in Finland. They had like this huge passion for developing games, but many of them didn't actually get that much of salary or they couldn't do the deals with the publishers. Some of them slept at the closet at the uh, office. <laughs> so they were, it was a lifestyle 
many of these guys were gamers. They wanted to be full-time gamers, so played games as a full-time hobby, but at the same time create fantastic experiences for the other gamers. But um, there's a Finnish saying that little is better than nothing, and I think this very much match with, with the uh, discussion about passion. So these guys were passionate about making games, but at the same time, like Yanni said, that it won't, it will never work. Like it never felt like a viable business. Rather, it felt like anything good will ever come out of this. And still, they spent like hours, hours and hours to develop games. Um, one lesson from the passionate uh, or passion um, and, and game development is that you know basically where you are. You know what's at the end of the rainbow. You know where you are. Uh, you, yeah, you would want to get, but the road to there is yeah. It's it's more like this mess. So you have no clue how to get there. The next story is about this guy, Samoli. Samoli is one of the um, founders of Remedy Entertainment, and this story um, is actually about the early days of Remedy. So Remedy is the creator of, of Alan Wake and Max Payne. Um, Samoli was a gamer. He was a huge fan of Finnish demo scene, and especially a demo group called Future Crew. Um, he wanted to be a part of that, and he got in, uh, got, got in touch with the guys of Future Crew and managed to, to become as an organizer because he couldn't code and he couldn't do any, any uh, graphics or art. So he, he started organizing, and Remedy was actually founded at the basement of, of Samuel's uh, parents' house. They were playing games like crazy, but they were also developing games. Um, they did a demo of Death Rally, save it to, to a floppy disk, and send it to the publishers. And actually, Apogee signed a contract with these guys. And when Samuli uh, walked up from the basement and showed the contract, including like actual real money, real, real, real payments, his father was blown away. He said that, okay, so you're actually doing something productive, not just playing games. And I think this um, nicely described the early days of the game industry. It was a lot of uh, passion, a lot of creativity, but no clue about the business and not that much of understanding of, of the um, connections of the community. Um, lessons learned from, from, from that. Um, we are all driven by different uh, motivational factors or motives. And social is one of the key motivations. So for these guys, they wanted recognition of their skills, of their productions. They wanted to belong into something, like a group of, of demo scene hobbyists or, or game developers or gamers. So they wanted to be part of the group. And without that uh, feeling of, of belonging, the feeling of, of of doing something better than the others, the feeling of passion towards game de development. Many of uh, later success stories would have never been uh, happened. So many, many companies would never have been founded. So for these guys, it's yeah, fun, a way to express yourself, but also get recognition from, from the peers. Um, the second story is about engagement, and this is actually a story about, yeah, it's, it's my story. Um, when these guys uh, were starting their companies, 
I was a university student. I was a gamer and I did research on games at the university. I was like, passionate about playing games and passionate about, about writing about games. And the press were, was really interested in the, the ideas and the, the issues I, I raised. But I felt that I wanted more. I, I wanted to be part of the core of the industry. My problem was that um, at that time, basically all game studios were very small ones, and they were founded by a group of friends. And I wasn't a friend of any of those guys. So I hadn't, I didn't have a clue like how to how to get into the, the core of, of the industry. Um, then, basically, luckily, in the early 2000s, um, two things happened. The, the first one was this um, like IT bubble, and the other thing was SMS games. And these two, uh, and also like the, the rise of, of Nokia as a company, so these issues uh, created a lot of, yeah, hype bubble around IT and games industry. And many companies were founded at, at those times. And the guys who were in the game industry didn't know everyone anymore. So that was actually the reason why uh, we started to have these like pub gatherings, which later turned to be ITDA gatherings. And that was the moment where I saw my opportunity. Um, I, I saw that the guys were not doing things too well. There could be many more and better issues they could actually do for the community. So I got into the, um, to, to in the, the discussions with the guys who were organizing the gatherings and said that, okay, actually I have a lot of ideas, so, so how about it? And they said that, okay, yeah, if you have the idea, so just do it. So it's not about talking, it's about doing so. That's what I did. I started organizing uh, events, gatherings, presentations. Then I uh, moved to actually coordinating the whole ITDA chapter. And now I'm, I have moved yet one level up to be a, the president of ITDA Finland um, and spanning the network of, of game development hubs across Finland. Oh, one more. This is um, our journey. So this is basically a few photos from the two th 2006 and, and then what happened during the, uh, the, the previous years. So around that time we didn't actually have any presentations. We just had the pub gatherings. But the problem was that there were a lot of like shy Finnish people. They were sitting with their own companies and not really networking that much. Um, so what we did is we actually um, made it easier for everyone to start mingling. We brought uh, sponsors to the events, which of course it's easier to meet people when you have your drinks and, and when it's very crowded, you actually have to talk with someone. And this is basically where we are now. So um, if you take one more. So um, last April, it was our like the craziest night ever. We had over, so usually we have, we are very, very active chapter. We have um, like monthly gatherings and people f between 200 and, and 400. But yeah, in April we actually had like 400 people a a attending the gathering, which, which, was, which is crazy. So just to give you an understanding, so Finland is a country of 5 million people. We have 200 game studios, a bit less than 2,000 2, people working in the industry. So 400 is a lot. And many of these, or majority of these guys are developers. We don't have that many students, so it's very much from the developers to developers. 
And it's always like, yeah, JPEG that it didn't happen. So we have been very successful. Um, we get this uh, ITDA Most Valuable Player Awards in 2007. And last year, we got this uh, internationalization award from the uh, president of Finland. That's the lady over there. So, of course, this is not the reason why, why we do community activities. But, uh, of course, yeah, it was heartwarming to, to receive the, both of the awards. But that said, um, nothing, none of those would have uh, not uh, would have happened without these guys. Uh, and I think this is like very great and important lesson to take. Um, it's always often um, highlighted that single man, whoever, Alexander the Great uh, created one of the biggest empires of ancient worlds, or Jean d'Arc, the uh, maid of uh, Orleans, uh, led French army to the many, many victories in the Hundred Years' War, or Chris Crawford uh, founded Computer Game Developers Conference, which later became GDC, which is one of the biggest game developer uh, events in the world. But the point is that none of this would have happened without the community, without people, without followers, without the guys who uh, believe and want to strive to the same goal. And that said, yes, I'm, there always has to be a leader, someone to show the direction, but without these guys, I wouldn't be able to guide the community anywhere, or at least like not as, as far as we have. Our secret sauce, um, why we have been so successful in, in creating and improving the industry, and the community is that we are open. We basically share everything. Uh, our mistakes, failures, successes, contacts, ideas. So everything is, is available. And the other thing with, with the uh, point we are open is that at our gatherings, um, we have uh, everyone from trainees to CEOs uh, coming to the gatherings. So it's not only about a uh, certain level of, of, of people, it's about like everyone. So basically you, you, got, you got to reach uh, and you get in, in touch with basically anyone, no matter like how, how big star or how many years have someone worked in the industry. We see that community rules and community helps. And with that, uh, I mean that if someone has a problem or if you don't have a clue what to do, which is often the case when there are uh, startups or new entrepreneurs uh, coming to the community events, some don't even know like what to ask. And in that sense, like community rules and we, we help as much as we can. Of course, everyone has to uh, do the work themselves, but we, are very um, willingly pushing people further. We also see that we are, like Finland's, all game studios in Finland, we are against the whole world. So we don't compete with other developers and that actually makes it easier to share everything. Best. It's not nothing out of, out of my, my success or out of my company if I share my uh, learnings or my contacts or, or some ideas. Um, and as, as an ITDA chapter, we focus on, on basically growing the industry. We want to make it easy for uh, noobs or startups to, to come to the events, to, to uh, get in touch with other people. And one way of doing this is that we have, for example, presentations where we share very hands-on lessons, again, from, from the industry and, yeah, for, from the developers for the developers. Find the right people actually means my, my team, so uh, this is a voluntary activity. It's our 
passion to create our own industry and our own, own game developer community. Um, and then it's a lot about trying and failing and trying and failing and trying and failing and, and learning from that. Uh, and may the best win means that yes, everyone has ideas and many people have the same ideas. So ideas are everywhere. It's not about who has the greatest idea. It's about who is able to make something fantastic out of the idea. Okay, third story is about gold dust. Um, and uh, this story takes us to the, uh, to the early years, years of, 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 of 2000. Um, there was this one Finnish uh, game studio, or yeah, maybe it's, we, we can call it game studio. <laughs> uh, the company called Riot E. Riot E was a legendary because in, um, in the early 2000s, they, um, they managed to uh, get over $20 million uh, funding. And they were also uh, able to spend all the money within the next two years. And then they went bankrupt. Um, I see, so that was basically, uh, that's why I said that I don't know if that's a, that was a game studio, so that was basically the greedy guys who saw the opportunity, but of course, like, yeah, good for them. Uh, but what I'm seeing at the moment is that it's not that much about like getting like massive uh, amounts of funding, but it, it's about um, many companies thinking that everyone or anyone can do like next supercells or next rovios without understanding that the guys working or who founded rovio or supercell those guys have been working in the games for a long time so they actually have experienced a lot of failures and a lot of successes a lot of uh, different uh, twists and turns of the industry Um, just to give you, as, as often, yes, uh, the focus is, is more on, on, on basically on or maybe like on, on this sector, on Angry Birds or on the Supercell titles. Um, but with this picture, I want to show that actually it's not only about um, single success stories, it's about uh, flow or progress. It's about those guys who started, well, those guys actually who started here, founded this company. These guys were um, active in the um, demo scene, so they were doing demos at the assembly, which is one of the biggest demo party in, in the world, but yeah, big, big party in Finland, so they were actually doing prototypes and, and like, games at the assembly, and then they founded Rovio, and yeah, failed many, many, many times before succeeding. And many of these guys, they have similar stories, a lot of experience, and also, like, these guys, Fingersoft or um, Frogmind, Rovia as well, they have learned a lot of, from, from those guys. So as I said, I, I want to stress the importance of, of sharing and learning from others. Again, it's, you are not against or competing against each other, but success is creating success and then you are stronger against the rest of the world. So what I'm saying is that hype, hype is very good for you. Uh, many game developers have this love or passion to, to develop games. And the other thing is, yes, everyone wants part of the gold dust, of course easy successes, easy, easy possibilities. My, um, um, hint or suggestion would be that, okay, first of all, you need to find your own way of game development. The Finnish way is very different from the American way. We are not selling stories and sharing dreams. We are very pragmatic. We are talking about technology about yeah, pixels and bytes and, and processors. And so I think this uh, 
comparison between Apple and Nokia is, is a great one. Apple is a fantastic dream and story, and Nokia is always about technology. And that also tells about the um, way how, how we sell things compared to the, the Americans. Um, what I'm trying to say is that, that you need to your, find your own way. Do not over-clarify the uh, pitching style of, of American companies or the Israeli and tech uh, successes or you know, Finnish game industry. You need to find your own way, own way of, of, of dealing with um, learnings from others, but also uh, building and creating the industry. So how are we different? How is Finland different? Um, one thing is, is, is based on the core competencies. So um, we have, uh, thanks to yeah, Nokia's existence in the country, we have a quite um, strong experience in um, mobile software development, telecom, IT industry. So as I said, it's yeah, Nokia land, so we are not about dreams, we are about practical <laughs> technologies. Um, the other competencies we have is that we actually have great public um, financial support. Someone say that Finland is a Moomin Valley, if you know Moomin character. So like happy valley without no fears and no problems uh, because of the public funding, but that's not actually the case. I think public funding makes it possible for many companies to get started. And yes, we have the crackers or the demo scene and, and gamers, those guys who love creating games and with the uh, skills and support can actually do that. Again, one learning from you. So what I said, hi hype is good for you because hype attracts investors and VCs. And VCs, so basically money attracts talent. It's easier to hire people when you actually have some, some money on your bank account. Talent means fresh ideas, and some of the talent actually comes from other ecosystems, which again is like learning from, from elsewhere. So we see that it, that's, a, that's a positive spin. Money brings talent, talent brings ideas, and, and that's the beginning of this, uh, more, more successes. Uh, let's skip this one. The uh, last story is about um, enablers. Um, and this story is, is actually about my friend Ilari, who founded uh, the first real Finnish company, Housemark. Uh, Housemark has been around for um, 18 years. They have done everything from console games to downloadable, uh, downloadable console games to mobile to whatnot, so the whole range. And they have had several misadventures during their, their path. Uh, for example, they, they, they too founded a, a mobile game studio, Spring Toys, uh, which, well, didn't really work out, but not because of, of the lack on, of talent, but because the market was not developing as they expected. So at the time when uh, mobile games were starting to boom, everyone ex expected that, okay, they will be great marketplaces, so places to sell the games. The technology, the handsets will be uh, ready. The distribution, everything works. But of course, yeah, nothing was there until, I guess, iPhone and iTunes and app stores came to the uh, picture. So. What I'm trying to say that is that um, there is a certain uh, there there are certain issues where you can have an impact, and then there are these like bunch of enablers that actually help you to to reach the goal. For them, the enabler would have been that the marketplaces would be there, or the handsets would actually uh, be able to uh, to uh, to play more high-end games. But that, that wasn't the case, so. But even if, if not markets, the enablers are, are like 
uh, funding or technology or different support systems, the community, so a lot of things that are basically out of your hands, but that will uh, help the developments and help your success in many ways. Um, this is um, the starting points or the enablers of, of growing the Finnish game industry. Um, in Finland, we actually had quite a bit of Commodore 64 and Amiga uh, hobbyists or guys as make, making games and distributing it, those on the, in the floppy disks. Uh, and those guys, um, or some of the guys who were doing uh, Amiga games or C, um, 64 games actually founded Assembly. Assembly, as I said, is a, one of the biggest demo scene uh, party in the world. And that's another example of, of community. Of course, RGD, RGDA is, is a community for game developers. Assembly is, well, of course, it has grown during, uh, w within the years, uh, but currently it's, it's more of this like community or gathering of, of gamers and demo developers or, or game developers. Um, there are some 7,000 people um, coming to, um, to the ice hole ring to, to spend a few days creating games or playing games. So first thing, yes, uh, the history or the uh, demo scene. The second was uh, community, whether it to be RTDA, the game developers community or the gamers community in different ways. Nokia has been very important for us because it was easy being at the edge of the world, basically, to, to know that we actually have something. We have this like massive company which can be a platform for, for our games. And the fourth is Tekes. Tekes is a national um, funding and innovation agency. So basically company who gives grants to, to companies to get something started. And so I, I added this <laughs> empty <laughs> Great scene here because I think this is one of the uh, this this has an impact to the uh, success story of, of Finnish game development. We have a lot of forest and, and not too many people, so there is certain motivation to do something to actually get out. <laughs> Next, um, a couple of um, maybe yeah. Let's skip this one and go to the next. So a couple of uh, numbers to give you an idea where we have traveled so far. Um, the, the numbers are all only from 2009, but it gives an understanding of, of what has happened. Um, this growth is not only due to Rovio and Supercell. Of course, yeah, they have a great impact to the numbers, but another very important thing for the growth is that um, we have had this like new boom of, of game studios. So a lot of game studios have been founded uh, within the last few years. And the most important thing is that earlier, majority, almost every game studio was at, at the capital of Finland, so in Helsinki. But now there are uh, more and more small uh, game development hubs uh, popping up uh, across Finland. And that was not possible before. But it is possible now because they, are, they see that, okay, you don't have to move to somewhere to be part of the industry, but you can actually create the industry around you. Earlier there, there were some companies, but usually they were like one or two, so that's not nearly a community and but thanks to the the latest uh, uh, developments the community has actually made it possible for uh, in a smaller towns across Finland for the game development hubs to to grow and this has an impact to the numbers as well few other numbers um, we have a bit more than 
what's at least the European average of women in the industry. And the number is growing when the companies are growing. So the bigger the com company, the more uh, different types of expertise uh, they need. Uh, I also added the average salary. Of course, average is always average, so it's very hard to understand what, what's, what's the range. The range can be quite high, but, but to give you an idea that it's, and, and to give some sort of uh, understanding is, is that like a lot to, to finish standards. I would say that that's, that's a decent salary, even like compared to the IT industry and bigger companies. The, um, oh yeah, so, so the previous one has actually like number of, of, of um, people working in the industry, and this is the, the, this is the turnover I already mentioned. But basically the same story uh, applies. The growth is due to the massive growth of basically two companies, but also uh, the blooming of, of startups across Finland. Yep. And few examples why uh, the growth is important, why hype is important, is that when there is interest to Finnish or Colombian game industry, it means that there is possibility to get invest like investors to your company. It's, it's way easier when, at least in Finland, uh, VCs or other uh, investors see that, okay, yeah, you have, you have Supercell and you have Rovio and, and some other success stories, so there must be the next big thing somewhere around here. So like which one of your, your company will be the next one, which makes it easier to get uh, investments. And the other possibility of, is, uh, of course, to, to be acquired um, or which I think is very important for us, which doesn't show too well on this slide, is that uh, last year um, Electronic Arts started this um, studio in Helsinki. Um, and um, yeah, Playhaven was another one who, who opened this like European uh, office in Helsinki. So that means that uh, companies that are not founded in Finland are or find it interesting to actually uh, open a branch in Finland to be able to better get the most out of the uh, growth or most out of the industry. So quickly, um, I have two, two lessons for you. So the first one is the one, two, three, four, five, six to get started. Um, and now I'm talking about the industry as, as a whole. So first thing, build on, on what you have. Like we had Nokia and Demoscene, for example. We build on that. The things you do, um, you do actually do not have at the moment will come. So do not forget to dream and make uh, plans. And okay, if you don't, ha don't have anything, uh, that's a great possibility for you to start something as, as things tend to uh, evolve very fast. Failing is part of the story. All of the uh, studios and also ITDF Finland, we have had many uh, failures, many learnings from the failures. There needs, needs to be a leader, so one torchbearer, whether it to be like ITDF Finland, someone who uh, is actively building and improving the community all the time, or in, in the industry, someone to actually lead the, the growth in the local uh, level or on the uh, national level. And I would very highly urge you to share things. Every company does not have to make the same mistakes. And when you do not make the same mistakes all over again, that means that your industry has better possibilities to start to grow way faster. And then my um, guidelines for, for building a developer community. Um, I, I would suggest you to start with the, uh, the question, okay, what, what's the core activity 
For example, some ITD chapters are very student-driven. ITD Finland is very developer-driven, so the core is game developers, and it's about learning from others, it's about sharing, it's about improving the industry from inside. And also, what's the need? So if the audience is game developers, what do they actually need? Okay, they need those uh, monthly gatherings and a couple of, of drinks with fellow developers, for sure. They need networking, yeah. But they also need um, possibilities to learn from in a most structural form. So, for example, us, uh, we um, offer presentations for the developers, so possibilities to, to learn, learn from, from different areas, from different uh, perspectives. So it's very much focused on like hands-on and not, not on, on the, uh, the low, lower level, but, but a bit um, advanced level of because, because of, of the audience that we have. As a leader of a community, um, it's very important to act fast and solve problems. We, ha we haven't had a problem we were not able to solve. We have been turning iPhones into microphones and, and creating plugs of, of who knows of what. But the thing is that there's no problems, basically. If the developers want to present their story, we make it happen, no matter what. Keep high quality and trustworthiness. Um, this is actually very important. Not every community understands that it's very important to have this like uh, continuation and quality, clear communication to the uh, community or industry. That the guys know that okay, it's okay to come to the gatherings. And actually, yes, the gathering is like next week or after two weeks. The quality means that everything works. The presentations are valuable for the audience. Push new, new ideas. Um, we have had this feedback box at our ITDF and gatherings for five years, and I guess we have got like one suggestion, which means that it doesn't mean that the guys don't need something different, but they are either lazy or they just don't know what they are, uh, what they need. And that's why we actually do that, that, that we, we push new ideas uh, and, and see how it works. Okay, yeah, presentations was actually one idea. Did it work perfectly? And then we have had uh, collaboration with Game Jam. If, yeah, if that works, yeah, we will continue that. If we will have different type of networking events or uh, collaboration with um, universities or other like educational institutes, yeah, that, that's the way to go. If that doesn't work, we will drop it off and try something else. And one very important thing is that document events and activities and history, um, it's way easier to sell it to uh, the venue if you, if you change the place where the gatherings are being held. Or, and it, it's, it's way easier to uh, explain what your community or IT days is about uh, to people that actually come to the events for, for the first time in their lives. So it makes it easier for people to, uh, to come and feel, feel, uh, feel, feel at home with, with the developers. And spread the word. Um, this is basically about um, spreading the word that, for example, our ITDF Finland chapter is not only in Helsinki, even though the majority of the studios are in, in one city. It's about sp spreading the idea that every game development hub, no matter how small, could uh, start something new or something uh, interesting in their area, so we can't control the whole country. We can help in many ways, but we, uh, by spreading the word, we can make it easier and uh, give guidelines to the people across the country to start improving and creating um, their own communities. So that's, that's for my presentation. Uh, thank you.
Thanks a lot, Sonia. Um, preguntas? So we actually had, I guess, a bit similar problem. We didn't have that many educational institutes that would actually um, teach game development or game design or graphics design for, for games or programming, like game specific. It, it's, we had the tech University of Technology or like technical institutes that uh, taught um, programming, but that was not, nothing to do with games. So what actually happened in, in our country was that it's, it was more about, um, uh, in the beginning, it, it was not that much about um, the educational institutes and the industry. It was about industry or individuals who uh, just uh, created things um, on their like basically pastime or free time. Later, like during the few, few la last few years, we had had a stronger uh, collaboration with the uh, educational institutes. But the thing is that it takes so much longer to, to build the uh, network of or the infrastructure for the uh, game education that it actually takes time to build the industry. So the industry is there. We desperately need new talent. And the one way of, of getting new talent is to build the um, different curriculums or uh, classes or courses for, for students to take in, in game development. But that is not, ha hasn't been happening until the like, recent years. So I would say that we basically had the same problem. If someone, like five years ago, if someone wanted to study game development or game design or something like, uh, such like specific related to games, we didn't have that much to offer. Mm. So, okay, in the early days, those companies that were doing games were actually doing console games or PC games. And what they did, they just tr traveled to, uh, to meet different publishers and they go, went to the trade events and, and conferences to meet publishers. So that was basically the way at that time. Currently, majority of Finnish game studios are, are doing mobile games. And then you have a different opportunity. You can publish your, the games yourself or you, you can have a publisher for, for, for your mobile game. Many see the, uh, uh, the possibility to do everything by yourself is a great asset, but that's one thing many developers do not understand, that when you are a, a developer and want to publish the game yourself, you also have to handle all the marketing, all the metrics or the analytics, basically the whole, whole palette. But like recently it has been, um, so basically yeah, there are two types of developers. Some, some want to, to do everything by themselves, which is easy, possible, thanks to yeah, Facebook, mobile platforms. And the others who just reach out, they basically have a long list of uh, mobile publishers and go to, to see, like ask from the community, okay, what do you think of these guys? Are those good ones? How, how's the deal? And they uh, yeah, start from there.
So, so the question is uh, for you, what is the definition of community? It's just the developers, but also the designers or the artists or the sound designers. What, what is exactly the definition of community that you have? So the community is basically the um, whole range of different uh, uh, experts in the game development. So from, yeah, from the big bosses, from CEOs to, um, we have several very uh, talented sound designers who are actively <laughs> going to the gatherings. But it's yeah, sound designers, artists, uh, programmers, level, level designers, marketing people, product managers, like the whole range basically. And that's I think one of the richness in, in our community. It's that it's, it's like wide on this way, but also like very <laughs> sort, of, sort of tall or wide on the, on the other, other scale, so yeah. So, uh, we want to be part of you. <laughs> um, no, uh, the idea is, uh, do, do you have plans for recruitment or, or gathering communities elsewhere, especially now that you're here in, in Colombia or in Latin America? So, I, I'm for the community. Um, and also, our gatherings are not actually about recruitments. As I said, yes, the industry needs a lot of talents. We got already this uh, small Brazilian community, so I would very warmly welcome tiny Colombian com community to Finland if you bear the weather. <laughs> but, but as I said, it's, um, it's, it's not about location. You can create great successes in anywhere in the world, and that's the greatest thing of, of like the current day, current, current times. Mobile game developer doesn't have to be in, in certain part of the world. We are at the very edge of the world. It's, I don't know, from, from this perspective, I don't know if you even see Finland on the other side of the globe, but there we are and doing very, very well. Uh, game, how important are game jams? So game jams are very important, ex especially for the students who want to get into the industry. Uh, some developers, like professional developers, also uh, attend game jams because that's a way of like, yeah, getting rid of, rid of the uh, limitations or, you know, dollars or schedules or, 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 or that type of things of, of bigger productions. But I would say that that's one of the, um, as I said, that even like even now, nowadays we don't have that many educations or courses to uh, for like game of game design or game development, and that's why it's very important for people from different uh, um, different different background, backgrounds to actually participate in the game jams and get things done within 48 hours. Because that's very important when, when, when fun, uh, looking for a job. That's your, your part of your portfolio. But yeah, so very, very important for the students. And one thing, I've been also uh, participating in the game jams, so one thing I liked very much was that, for example, in our team we had, uh, it, it was basically like a combination of very uh, experienced people and, and, and students. And, and both, like, I learned a lot from the students, and the students most likely learned a lot from the, the way we did the production.
You mentioned that there is uh, only 60% of uh, women in, in the game industry in Finland. Do you think that affects in some way your industry? Would you like to have more or? Yeah. Uh, most definitely it affects. Um, I'm actually also running a mentor program for women because we def or definitely need more women or basically like more diversity to the industry. And as I said, like we are currently, the, the companies are growing so they need new talent. And the problem with, with women is that many are not, uh, well, it, it seems that, that many women are not or do not consider them, themselves to be like uh, good enough for for the positions. They they read the every line and see that okay, yeah, tick tick tick. But okay, that doesn't apply, so I, I won't even apply for the job, which is a big problem as there are very very talented people who just don't don't uh, even uh, apply for for jobs. But so I'm very. Uh, big believer of, of diversity. Diversity means like different ideas, different approaches, but also it uh, it makes good to the companies. I've been um, in, in 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 some companies. I, I have been the only female uh, developer. In in like lately, I, I was working in Digital Chocolate, and there we had maybe. A 10 out of, I don't know, 90 <laughs> that were women. And that had like massive impact to the, the whole atmosphere and, and way of working. So yeah, I think, I think that's a problem. And that's why also the mentor uh, program that we are, we are, we are running is, is there. So it's basically the mentor program is that there are a group of females who have been in the game industry for yeah, years and years and representing different areas from human relations to marketing, programming, art, product management, entrepreneurship, so all types of, and sound design, different areas. And we want to match make these uh, more experienced people with people or girls or women who haven't been in the industry yet to, to make it easier to get, make connections and also understand um, how is the industry like, how easy it is to get into and how acceptable it is towards different, uh, like diversity, basically. Thanks. Great questions. <laughs> no more questions? Okay, so let's thank again, Sonia. Eh, muchas gracias a todos por estar acá en el track de videojuegos. Eh, algunos anuncios para el día de hoy. Eh, en la carpa eh, va a ser el anuncio del plan Soy Digital del Ministerio a las 6 de la tarde. Eh, a las 7 de la noche en la Casa de la Cerveza es la inauguración del plan Social App. Eh, a las 7 de la noche en el Casino Crown tenemos en IGDA, organizado por IGDA, el Meet and Greet de videojuegos. Y eh, a las 5 de la tarde aquí en la zona T, Va a empezar un, un toque, un conjunto de grupos van a, van a tocar un rato para que todos disfruten un rato. Entonces, eh, los esperamos mañana de nuevo a las 8 y 45 en el track de videojuegos y que gocen el, el evento. Esa información me la acaban de dar a mí. <risa> y es una excelente pregunta, pero yo creo que la mayoría está en la aplicación Colombia 3.0, ahí la puedes bajar, o en el schedule que está en la hoja web. Eh, desafortunadamente no, no sé si está...